Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. My presentation today, I'm calling Rockets Red Flare. We just came off of a wonderful weekend here in the United States, um, Independence Day. Second to probably Thanksgiving, Independence Day is my favorite holiday of the year. Now, why would that be? Well, I have a very personal connection to this month of July. When I was five years old, on July 2nd, 1984, my family and I traveled from Mexico City to our new home in Sacramento, California. I distinctly remember all the commotion that happened before that day of travel. Um, we had to get new outfits and family photographs and passports taken and uh, get all our documentation and our luggage together. And then on July 2nd in the morning, we went to the airport and boarded the, this giant airplane, which was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. I was seated, seated next to my grandfather and my grandmother, and my brother and my mom were on a different aisle. And when we landed, it was kind of dusky late at night in Sacramento, and the doors opened. We walked out to the parking lot to, to meet our aunt, and I remember this blast of hot air coming towards us. It was so nice and air-conditioned on the plane and in the airport. So that was kind of a shock, like welcome to summer. And I also remember crickets, just crickets everywhere, meaning it was definitely warm out there. They were full chirp away. The following day was my birthday, July 3rd, and we had a wonderful birthday party with ice cream and cake and candles and presents and balloons. It was incredible. And then the following day was 4th of July, and I thought, my goodness, these people really want me to be here. They're so welcoming to me. And ever since then, I've always had a very strong connection with the 4th of July, my birthday. So this year, in celebrating my 35th birthday, Frank surprised me with a really wonderful planned trip to the mountains in Washington. There I am. Uh, we are on a lake near Mount St. Helens, which uh, about 24 years ago blew its top and took out a huge part of that landscape. And it's coming back. You can see that here. So needless to say, I, I was really excited and happy to be out of town and experiencing something new, but I was also a little concerned that I would be missing my favorite part of my birthday, which would be the fireworks. After some searching around, um, we were staying in a, a local little town called Morton, very small town, they had nothing going on. So we asked and they even didn't know where the nearest fireworks would be, so we just managed to find our way down to another little town called Randall to have dinner, and it just so happens that we noticed everybody was gathering around the local high school getting ready to watch their fireworks display. So I was pleasantly surprised I got my fireworks for my birthday after all this year. And Randall did it right. They did a pretty good job. They had a serious, professional, 30-plus minute fireworks display, and everybody enjoyed it. It was really wonderful. As we were sitting there watching, I remember contemplating all the wonderfulness and excitement of my first fireworks display and forgive my screen there um, and also just thinking how it's evolved and how I love fireworks and you know living in Los Angeles going to the beach being uh, at home when I was a kid and buying fireworks from the uh, in front of the grocery store and bringing them home and setting them on fire and just all the wonderful things connected to that but also just contemplating more what fireworks mean now in this day and age and so the good, the bad, and the ugly, like everything in life, even the most wonderful things have a little bit of darkness to them. So the good. Uh, fireworks have been brought with us for many, many thousands of years, of course originating in China. Uh, some history has it that a Chinese monk named Li Tian, um, who lived in the Hunan province, created the first fireworks about a thousand years ago. But then there are stories about a cook creating them by accident, even a thousand years previous, and noting that you know if you stuff these different chemical compositions into bamboo, it would explode. And so they became very integral in rituals, and they continue to this day. Uh, any ceremonies would be lighting off lots of fireworks um, to spook off the ghosts because it was loud bangs, and the smoke would send them away and clear it and make the the area really good. Um, Good luck for the, whatever the ceremonies is there to uh, generate goodwill among the people who live there. One of my favorite things about now and current pyrotechnics is the amazing innovation that's going on. Just the different kinds of materials and colors and shapes and all of the ingenuity that it takes to put them together 
and time them in such a way and you know considering winds and atmosphere and all these things still to come out with smiley faces and cubes and galaxies that's always my favorite is just to see what the newest hottest firework is we didn't see any of the new fireworks in Randall um, I think they put more of their money into quantity rather than the razzmatazz which I appreciated and now for the bad they're expensive. Uh, here in Seattle, we're constantly having a, are we going to have fireworks this year or are we not? Because they are so expensive. And during the recession, the city was very much budget strapped. But thankfully, we have a lot of millionaires in Seattle, and they stepped forward and were able to fund the launching of the fireworks. So they have not been canceled in Seattle. But other cities, I know that they have canceled them, even if not for the expense of them themselves, for the danger that they cause. Uh, fires and you know having to deal with those. The picture down on the left there is a fire that happened last year um, in Seattle. Illegal fireworks in a warehouse set a whole structure on fire and you can see it happening in the background there. Those were the legal ones um, and we couldn't really tell. There was like a lot of smoke going on and then the fire trucks were starting to come in but of course all the spectators were blocking the road so that was quite an expensive fire, million dollars worth of boats. Thankfully no lives but very expensive. Another bad thing about fireworks is that they are very toxic. They are made with metals and chemicals and they create a lot of really small particulate matter. And in fact, there's a study that's been done recently in China uh, amongst smog fears, perhaps even calling for a ban on, on fireworks for New Year's because the air pollution is already so bad from industry. And then you add on top of that all of this festivity. And, in fact, uh, when we were coming home from Randall, I remember hearing on the news that the air quality in Seattle, we had a kind of a low pressure zone blanket that the weathermen were warning people with asthma and other respiratory sensitivities to stay inside the day after the fireworks display because there was still so much soot in the air. And then sadly, fireworks are also so dangerous because they explode. This gentleman here on the right, his name is Bill Hill, he was 75 when he perished doing what he loved, which was creating fireworks for cities like Randall that we saw. Um, they had a big explosion at the fireworks factory in Tenino um, shortly before 4th of July. Two others were able to escape but had some injuries and uh, with a sad heart the employees returned back to work because you know, Bill was definitely very dedicated to his contribution to society which is bringing joy to people by bringing them fireworks displays. So it's unfortunate he lived his life and, and passed it doing something he loved but still the show must go on and people were able to continue and to move forward and, and generate those fireworks for the rest of the cities. And now the ugly. Recently we were listening to the radio and heard a story about this combat veteran who created this Facebook page um, and has a sign that says Combat veteran lives here. Please be courteous with fireworks. He served many deployments in Iraq and um, he definitely has a big aversion to fireworks. And not necessarily those that he knows are going to happen, the scheduled ones, the big city ones, but the fireworks that kids light off in their backyards before, after, many days after 4th of July, and how that can really send him reeling back into that warfare aspect that he just escaped from. And so he is definitely asking his neighbors to be considerate of his triggers and the fact that he, you know, fought so much for our own liberties and yet is tortured by, you know, small celebrations here at home. So that's heartbreaking to hear that somebody would spend their life and, and give so much of themselves and come home and just be triggered by things that bring us joy in this time of year where we celebrate our freedom. And that is the conundrum, isn't it, with fireworks, at least for me, that they are intricately tied with warfare. The uh, Star Spangled Banner, in fact, was written uh, shortly uh, after 1814 by Francis Scott Key. He wrote a poem. He didn't put it to music, but the poem formed the foundation of our anthem here in the United States. And Francis Scott Key was a uh, pacifist, you could say. He abhorred the thought of war, but when his uh, city, the city of Baltimore, Maryland, was being bombarded uh, by the British in 1814, um, it went on for 24 hours, and in the morning mist, he looked out and saw that the flag was still waving, saying, you have not beaten us, and that he uh, was able to write this poem, Star Spangled Banner, 
Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? Indeed it does. And so today I'm announcing, I guess, of sorts, um, my path to citizenship. It's been a long path since I was five years old. I moved here with my parents. We, uh, by a stroke of luck, my grandmother was born in Downey, California. And through her birthright, we were able to get our papers together and move to this country. Now, it did take a while. My mom, when she found out she was pregnant with me, began the process of applying for um, legal residency. And she was granted it, but then my brother came along, so we had to start over. And she did that, and we were able to make our paperwork. And on July 2nd, 1984, we came to this country. Now, ever since then, you know, our papers have been legit. We've been fine. Um, and there wasn't really any reason for me to look into it until I was preparing for college. And I thought, you know, probably would be a good deal. Some of the scholarships that I was looking into were uh, a requirement was to be a citizen. And so as I began to look into it, I realized, or I, I came to know that you couldn't become a citizen until you were 18 and or one of your parents was a citizen. And at that time, neither of my parents were. So I was kind of stuck. I went on to college and I kept thinking about it, but of course back then it was always a couple hundred dollars for the application fee that I could use for other things. And as I've grown older, it's always been that, and every time I check, I'm like, oh, $600, and it keeps going up. But at least it's hold steady at $600, so um, yeah, it's a bit of money, but it's also time. Um, I enjoy every right of a citizen here in the United States. I pay taxes, uh, I can get Social Security, I just can't vote. And uh, that's a big mm, uh, item in my life that I'm missing, this full participation in everything that goes on within my own experience here in this country. And so I am beginning that process. I finally have a little bit of money that I can actually put down towards the application. The application itself is fairly long, um, and in addition to the application, there is a test. Now, if only I had taken this test when I was in high school, I aced the AP history exam. I could probably do a lot better then. But nonetheless, some of those questions, you know, you should really know who your senator is, who your congresswoman is, um, and I will be brushing up on that. But something that has been, frankly, a little bit of an obstacle for me is this part of the application, uh, specifically the questions that you have to answer yes or no to. Um, and I'm going to specifically focus on the two here I've highlighted. You may not be able to read them if you're far away, but question number 50 on the application asks, if the law requires it, are you willing to bear arms on behalf of the United States? I am not. Question 51, if the law requires it, are you willing to perform non-combatant services in the U.S. Armed Forces? I am not. Derek, you may remember Geez, it must have been about 10 years ago when I approached this topic again, at least internally in terms of going forward with my citizenship application. And I asked you to write a letter of support for me, uh, basically vouching that I'm a long life uh, pacifist of sorts. I, I do not subscribe to violence. Um, and I could not imagine taking the life of another, no matter what cause. And so why am I asking you to listen to me today about this? Why do you need to know? Well, recently I just discovered as I'm going through this process, uh, another uh, lady in very much the same position as me, so about the same age, similar background, uh, her citizenship application was rejected because she objects to war. But she's not religious, she's an atheist. And so the uh, rejection letter basically stated you can't you know, be anti-war if you're not part of a religion. And that made me think about my own position here. You know, very much what we talk about is rooted in some aspects of Tao, the religion, but we focus a lot more, at least in these presentations, on the philosophy of the Tao and using these tools to live by. Certainly there's that common thread that we are searching for connection, for answers to life, for, for solidarity with the Tao and, and to be part of the one. So there is that. But Part of that for me is just finding out your true self and who you really are, ultimately peeling back all those layers and simplifying and getting to the truth of the matter, right? So here today, I'd like to ask you, you know, if you were to be quizzed and asked about your citizenship, what would you be willing to fight for? 
And more importantly, what would that fight entail? Would that fight entail violence and the taking of somebody's life, even if for a good cause? What would that cause have to be for you to go to that level? For me, I find that this question is the hardest because the fight is internal. It is to fight against the ego uh, constantly of when faced with evil, what would you do? Because evil, as we've talked about before, exists in the world, likely will never go away. It is part of the human condition. It is part of that darkness, that spot of black in that yin-yang. It is our cultivation and our experiences and practice that will allow us to choose the right path when we are confronted with evil and have to fight. And to choose the freedom to have the right choice, I guess you could say. And I think a lot of that we are being uh, introduced to some really important tools. I think Bill for his previous presentation where he talked about emptiness and to be kind, non-contentious, because evil exists, and whether we let it take hold of our own mentality and go towards that dark energy, or really choose to fight it, is what we're here to do every day, just step by step, strengthen our resolve. So hopefully I'll bring it back here to the connection in the Tao. Fireworks were always so special to me because they were just magical. Um, but as I've grown older and learned more about science and what they mean and what they are and maybe the bad parts about them, you know, it's still like that magical aspect. Recently, Frank and I were watching a television show discussing the earth from above, and uh, it really brought to mind Aurora, nature's fireworks. These are caused by solar flares that uh, emanate from our sun and yet are absorbed by the magnetosphere of our earth. So if it weren't for the magnetosphere, those lovely rays would instantly burn us and turn this whole uh, earth into Mars, essentially nothing left of humanity or nature or anything. But our magnetosphere protects us. It directs those highly charged particles into the upper atmospheres. And as they interact with the elements in the air, nitrogen and oxygen and uh, all the other elements that are out there, predominantly those are the two ones, they radiate colors. I think it's fantastic that you know these natural fireworks exist and are equally as dangerous but in a different way come to us from our sun which gives us life and can take it away as well. On July 3rd my mother gave birth to me. My mother's name is Aurora and I hope that together we will be embarking on a citizenship application process together and we will one day celebrate by going to Alaska to witness her namesake. So with that, my recipe for today, I basically stole from Alton Brown. I highly suggest you go onto the internet and Google Alton Brown popcorn. His little clip is hilarious and so informative. And, uh, you know, we have an air popper, but sometimes making air, uh, popcorn on the stove is so much more uh, nostalgic. And this is a really great way to do it. The secret is to use a large, fairly thick metal mixing bowl, you know, big salad bowl, make sure it's metal. Um, combining three tablespoons of peanut oil, that gives it the extra yumminess, that little bit of fat, uh, as opposed to an air popper if you can afford the calories. And combining that with really fine kosher salt, so you process that in a food processor, a couple pulses to make it really fine. It coats the kernels much more thoroughly and you get more of that saltiness in every kernel instead of every other. Combine that into the bowl and uh, cover it with foil, punch a few holes in it to let the vapor escape and you just constantly shake it on the stove, kind of like those Jiffy Pop ones, but homemade, um, for about two minutes until the popping stops. And then once it's stopped, you remove the bowl, let it cool down so you don't burn your fingers, and uh, you can season it to taste with any sorts of uh, herbs, vegetable uh, powders, that is, and of course butter. A uh, great way to do it is if you melt the butter, put it in a squeeze bottle, you'll get much better distribution. So with that, thank you everyone. I hope you have a fantastic Sunday and uh, I return it to Derek.